We love Friston, and I mean, because Active Inference is actually about preferences. It's you know, because an agent expresses agency by right. um, kind of like adapting the environment to suit its preferences or to kind of make the environment like its preferences. So basically, this is a, a theory of volition. Right. And an actor, you know, that what, what Carl Friston's talking about is where do these goals come from? Where does the volition come from? And, and right. you spoke with Carl about that, I, I think, over several years, didn't you? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Carl's been a wonderful mentor of mine. Um, I honestly I like uh, it's a funny story. I like one. I didn't know this was a term in academia, but there's the, the reviewer lottery where you just get lucky and you get a reviewer. <laughs> so the first paper I submitted. Uh, Carl Friston was a reviewer on, which was just lucky. And then he became a mentor and, and, and reviewed my book and gave me lots of good feedback. So yeah, he's an amazing uh, person, been a wonderful mentor of mine. Um, so yes. So, okay. So let's talk about granular versus a granular. Cause I think the best theory I've seen is Friston's theory on this. In my mind, it bridges the gap between internalism and externalism because it is describing this kind of didactic exchange to use. You know, there are certain high entropy words that only Friston uses. So if I say di <laughs> didactic exchange, you know, I'm, and by the way, if you if you um, just for the folks at home, if you read Friston's papers, there are certain words. So he says this licenses something. So, you know, if you see the word licenses, then Friston wrote the paper. But anyway, <laughs> Max Bennett's new book, A Brief History of Intelligence, Why the Evolution of the Brain Holds the Key to the Future of AI, is really, really good, and I recommend you read it. The book kicks off with a quote from Charles Darwin from way back in 1859, and it's about how psychology and understanding the human mind was all about to change, big time. The main insight from Darwin was this recognition that capabilities get added by graduation, almost as if there was a cosmic optimization algorithm being applied in the background. Bennett's book is a treasure trove of ideas, and it covers five big themes about how our brains evolved. The first one is steering, and then reinforcing, so learning about what happens to us, you know, like when you touch something hot and you learn not to do it again. Simulating, when your brain is like a personal VR headset, constantly creating scenarios about what might happen next, mentalizing, figuring out what's going on in the brains of other people's heads, and last, but definitely not least, is speaking, which is to say, our language. Now, your brain is always running these simulations or these make-believe scenarios about everything, whether you're remembering your last birthday party or planning what you're going to say in a job interview or just experiencing whatever's happening right now, your brain kind of tricks you into thinking it's all real. But actually, it's making it all up. So this whole thing is pretty similar to how computer models like ChatGPT work. They don't really store specific paragraphs of text. Instead, they're always pastiging together new text based on patterns and context. Anyway, Bennett's book and our conversation really made me think about how wild it is that so much of what we see and remember or even plan isn't as straightforward as we think. What's really interesting about, about this book, Max, is, um, you know, obviously I've, I've read loads and loads of books in, in the space and there's, you know, people like Hinton and Hawkins and Damasio and Friston and, uh, I mean, God, you know, you, you, even like Sutton. And what's interesting is it's a bit like the blind men and the elephant. So they've all got a completely different story to tell. And mm. I think the magic that you have pulled off with this book is somehow you've woven it together into a mm. coherent story. Like, what, what do you think about that? You know, and I didn't come to it with the objective of writing an academic book at all. I came to it from the objective of I was just learning on my own. Um, and I just started building this corpus of notes because um, I was so independently curious. And I kind of stumbled on this idea really for myself of how do I make sense of all of these disparate opinions um, and really this complete lack of information about how the brain actually works. Uh, Hawkins spoke about this as well. He said, we've got the matrix inside our brains, right? We're always just doing all of these simulations of, of future things. And uh, we're using that to kind of help us understand the world. And you, you give this really interesting example of um, some of the features of the brain that kind of lead you to believe that we are basically living in a simulation. And it's almost like rather than perceiving things, we're testing 
if our simulation is correct. First sort of introspections and explorations into how perception works in the human mind happened in the late 19th century with all of these explorations of visual illusions that you see in pretty much every neuroscience textbook or book that you open. You've probably seen examples of triangles where you actually perceive a triangle in a picture when there is in fact no triangle, that clearly the brain observes the presence of things even though they're not actually there. So we perceive a triangle there, we perceive a sphere, we perceive sort of a bar, we perceive the word editor, when in fact, if you actually examine that, the word E is not there. That always seems very vague. I'm, I'm kind of experiencing it, but it feels like the experience is over there and, and I'm over here. Whereas right now I'm having a conversation with you and everything is, is in 4D is cinema color. And yep. an hour ago, I was kind of simulating me having this conversation with you. <laughs> and that was also a little bit distant and not quite as bright as this conversation right now. So, you know, just from a phenomenology point of view, or, or maybe from a coherence point of view, what's the difference? I don't think we know. I think that's a really great question, which is why is it the case that um, real sensory input feels so much richer than closing our eyes and imagining things. Um, and, and is it perhaps, is it a feature or a bug? Is part of the feature somehow ensuring the fact that we don't confuse the two? Um, you know, is hallucination, people who hallucinate, who do experience it perhaps in the same 4D color, is the flaw that um, they're re-rendering something and they can't tell the difference? Would you, would you think that intelligence is quite specialized? Yeah, I would, I would put myself in the Jan LeCun camp on this where I don't yeah. think... Uh, there is a general intelligence. I mean, I, I've gone around, talked to so many people in the space, asked for a definition of AGI. The smartest people in the world keep giving me different answers. <laughs> so, um, and I don't think that's a coincidence. I think it's because we don't really know what we mean by that term. We know there's this thing called human-like intelligence, and we know we're very interested in at least recapitulating that in a machine. And then we can conceive of ways to ramp that up. It'd be nice to have a human-level intelligence that you know, didn't have uh, certain types of biases. Well, we could probably tweak some parameters to do that. We'd like them to have better memories. We could probably tweak some parameters to do that. Um, but it's, I'm skeptical of the view that there's going to be one general intelligence that does all of these things, because I think at the end of the day, there's going to be certain tasks that we want these entities to do. And there's always going to be energy efficiency, uh, speed efficiency, all these things that will be gained by adding some inductive biases, adding some specialization into these systems to do the tasks we want of them. Transformers are ob ostensibly um, intelligent artifacts. I mean, some people even call them proto-AGIs. But uh, cynically, <laughs> though, you could say, well, they're, they're just they're basically a, a database lookup and they don't have any agency. They don't have any creativity. They only have combinatorial creativity. And, and, then, and then you kind of make the move of, of asking, well, isn't it? It's a bit weird. It's a bit weird that, that it's fooled so many people. It's, it's apparently so intelligent, you know, and, and it's just capturing some snapshot of, of a very complex system. The subspace of our language is actually um, not that big. And, and that's because language as an organism has evolved to be learnable by children. There are clear, fascinating general, I think, uh, clear, amazing generalizations that transformers are capable of. I mean, the fact that the reason why this is so hard to measure, which is one of my critiques of sort of the way this whole transformer craze has unfolded, is part of what we mean by intelligence is the distinction between the training data and the test data. In other words, can you perform a task in a relatively new environment from where you've been trained? It's at least one of the key dimensions on which we wanna measure intelligence. And because the training data is obscured, it's very hard to validate the difference between you know, the stochastic parrot critique, which is, I'm asking you a really hard question, you answered it well, but I have no idea if that's actually literally a database lookup, or I'm asking you a really novel question, and clearly you learned some concepts and then presented something uh, and came to a really clever conclusion. And it's really hard to tell the difference of this, primarily because we don't know the training data. It, I think it does shine a lens on us that so, there are so many things that we thought were intelligent that maybe aren't. Right. Well, this goes a little bit to more of X paradox where, yeah. you know, the things <laughs> like we like to laud lawyers for being so smart. And then all of a sudden, you know, a transformer beats the bar exam and then it still can't load a dishwasher. Right. Which is OK. The things that are so obvious for us are actually part of what's so hard. Yeah. I, I don't know whether you have the same impression as me, but I think when ChatGPT came out, everyone was quite scared. People were talking about it, automating jobs and um but now I look on LinkedIn and I can easily recognize ChatGPT text. It's delving, diving, right. intricate, you know, it's like TED Talk type speech. And I feel like people are now starting to see it for what it is. You know, it's like a, 
a cute toy, but it's it's not really going to be quite as revolutionary as everyone thought. But there are some real problems with it, kind of polluting the infosphere. It's it's cannibalizing these retrieval search engines are cannibalizing the actual search engine, and and now the models are kind of eating their own poop and and training on on the output. <laughs> <laughs>